Director of Content with Hill International, a global project and construction management firm headquartered in Philadelphia. I'm here today with Vice President and Senior Advisor, Resiliency and Disaster Recovery Services, Andy Robinson. Uh, Andy, relatively new to Hill, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you wound up in this role? Sure. So I started working in disaster recovery about oh, 13 years ago with Katrina. I was assigned to be the executive director of the program management office for Katrina, a very large housing project to rebuild there in Louisiana. I then did work uh, and managed a division that did this work all over the nation. And uh, we did work in Sandy uh, with the housing programs there. And then I moved on to do work in uh, Irma and Maria. Uh, Ebola and several other disasters uh, in the nation. <laughs> Andy, we're, we're sitting here talking. It's late August 2021. Uh, we have record setting uh, wildfires in California, right. serious floods in Central Europe, uh, ongoing issues with COVID. How are we going to both recover from these disasters and make future infrastructure projects more resilient? Well, uh, to be uh, blunt about it, it's going to be very challenging. And uh, it's not only that we're continuing to have these disasters, they seem to be getting worse. Uh, there used to be something called the 12 year hurricane life cycle. So every 12 years, uh, category 5 hurricane would, would strike the U.S. We expected that to happen. Clearly now that is broken. They're hitting with more frequency each year. Uh, in addition to that, we have, right now as we, we sit here and speak, Chris, we have the largest California fire, the Dixie Fire, burning still out of control. Um, this weekend in Waverly, Tennessee, a new phenomenon is cropping up and it's called the microburst where in a short period of time uh, rain it rains uh, almost on a, on a permanent basis and they had 17 inches of rain in less than 24 hours killed 22 people still many missing uh, as we speak here today and a, and a, a hurricane hit Rhode Island so th clearly things are different. I'll just say it that way, that, that things are different. And they're challenging uh, for the uh, states and the uh, recipients, the sub-recipients out there to react to all of this. Um, and, and so their responsibilities are increasing as, as, as these disasters increase. And at the same time, uh, they're being asked to think about resiliency and get going with building a more uh, safe and hardened infrastructure. So it's very challenging times, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of professional support is required and needed to help pull this off to make this happen. And I think I think Hill's got some of those skill sets. Uh, it reminds me, and we were discussing earlier, of how in the wake of the terrorist attacks of 9/11, there was such an initiative to harden our infrastructure to keep the public safe and to make the public sphere more secure. Right. Do you see any parallels there? Well, I do. Um, I think uh, a, a couple of years ago, we felt pretty secure about what was taking place uh, in Afghanistan and thought that the terrorist uh, threat was subdued. Obviously today, we might not feel that way with what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, we have the additional concern uh, of what cyber criminals can do. Uh, there's been recent attacks on our infrastructure uh, from nation state actors and organized crime, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have a worldwide pandemic that's taking place as we speak that's uh, challenged the entire world's uh, economies and governments and infrastructure, uh, as we know. And then in addition, as we, we spoke of, you have these weather events, which seem to be occurring in a more and more frequent basis. So yeah, it's, it's a it's a very uh, challenging and difficult time uh, to manage through all this uh, uh, at the moment, no doubt about it. What are 
are some of the opportunities uh, you see your resiliency and disaster recovery clients sometimes miss? And how could they better recognize those opportunities to, to drive success? Let me, let me first of all say I'm totally sympathetic to the difficulty of the job. Um, they're, they're sometimes influenced by political wins. Uh, people are never happy in a disaster. Think about it, you know, their houses, their livelihood have all been threatened. They're, they're, uh, oftentimes their communities are washed away or blown away, et cetera. So it's a very difficult, emotionally intense environment that they're working in. And so uh, uh, I, would, I would tell you that in that situation, the first piece of advice I would give them is, don't get too focused on just the money and just the programs. Do have an eye on the stakeholders. It's a multi-stakeholder environment. Carve out some time for the seniors to uh, participate, communicate with, and listen to all the stakeholders. Uh, that's a lesson I was taught early in disaster recovery, and I think it's a very important one uh, to take forward. Um, and then I would also say is that don't just award dollars and monies and programs and not follow up and not have some overarching uh, management construct. I, I, I think could be the PMO, could be whatever, whatever you want to call it, but these are large, difficult programs and some type of governance structure, uh, key performance indicators, uh, define the process by which you get things done, uh, et cetera, needs to, be, needs to be taken seriously and needs to be put in place early on so that the executives can manage that situation, identify early on the risk, identify the problems and solve those problems. And if you don't set up those constructs early on, those problems will come, I guarantee you. And if you don't have those tools, you'll be in a very difficult position. Um, some people lose their jobs at that point in time because of uh, the repercussions of that. So that, that's the two things I would tell them up front is, yes, listen and get a good relationship to the extent possible with the stakeholders and put those constructs to manage your program and your disaster in up front. That is, that is very critical in my mind. recognizing, I think, across the entire world, the importance of maintaining and developing our infrastructure. Right. As governments from the Middle East to the European Union to here in the United States address this generational issue. Right. Uh, how are these agencies, uh, both grantees and the funding agencies, going to make sure that these infrastructure projects incorporate strong resiliency principles? Right. So the good news is those principles exist, and most of the people that build the highways and bridges, they know about them, and they have been incorporating them uh, in, in the recent, recent past. I remember doing white papers with uh, George Washington University in the 07-08 period on the concept of resiliency. Um, the good news is that through the infrastructure, and they planned in resiliency, but also through the uh, uh, FEMA and HUD programs, there's more money for resiliency than ever before in our nation's history. Uh, the challenge is that uh, there's also more disasters, and so folks are gonna need to change the wheels of the car while the car is going down the road, but we have to do it. Uh, we'll never have this opportunity with the funds again, and we need to get prepared for the next, next event because it's surely, surely coming. Uh, so I think, I think a lot of, as I talk to clients out there, um, they're uh, struggling with the workload and they're looking for professionals that could help them with the applications to access some of the grant dollars. They'll then be looking for the help to implement and make sure that the dollars are spent wisely. And so uh, this is the sort of the charge of the day for, for uh, the resiliency professional be it in infrastructure, be it in uh, emergency management, uh, wherever. The good news is, is that these concepts work, and we now know that. 
Uh, you look at what happens with flooding now in New Orleans and through the reconstruction and building of uh, the dikes and the flood systems and the pumps down in New Orleans, it works. Uh, we had that experience with the new engineered roofs that were built in the Virgin Islands. That, that program works. Uh, they don't come off in hurricanes anymore. So the concepts that we're talking about, we now have plenty of proof that they work. We know that the dollars are well spent and it's just a matter, again, of being able to do two things at once and definitely is going to be challenging, but we've got to meet that challenge. And I, th I think Hill can help people meet, meet that challenge, actually. Hill and some of our partners as well, by the way. Resiliency is going to be a, a very important topic, uh, whatever form the U.S. infrastructure package takes. Right. Uh, what does the future of resiliency look like in the U.S.? Well, um, the country needs uh, resiliency to be very successful. Um, the reasons are, are, are pretty simple. I mean, last five years there was 81 multi-billion dollar disasters in the country, uh, uh, $630 billion in damages and over 5,000 deaths. So with the uh, simple math of what's taking place out there, looking like things are going to be on the increase in that regard, uh, we need resiliency to work. We need to take these infrastructure dollars, we need to take the resiliency dollars, and we need to put them to work to prevent some of that from happening. It, it's going it's to require uh, planning. Um, it's going to require some design and engineering type work is going to require a lot of program and construction management work to make sure that that all happens. And so Hill stands ready in this regard uh, to help. We have the experience. We've done this kind of work all over the world on some of the world's largest projects and it applies to these projects as well uh, fully and uh, we look forward to having those discussions with uh, our clients and potential clients to help them struggle with that and make sure that we get the most from resiliency and these spins that are going to take place here in the next decade. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Chris.